I learned something this last week. Uh, Steve McQueen, the Steve McQueen I knew, rode a motorcycle and he was an actor in uh, films and he's passed on. But there's another Steve McQueen who is a producer. And he announced at the beginning of this year, and I don't know where the project is at this point, that he was uh, producing a new sci-fi series for Amazon. And it was to be entitled Last Days. And it was to be about, and as I say, I don't know where it is in production, it was to be about a controversial secret plan devised by various world governments uh, to selectively colonize Mars because artificial intelligence had taken over the dying Earth and it was in its twilight years that the Earth was. Well, that's one way that people often think about the last days through some science fiction thriller, usually dystopian. What does the term mean when it's used in the scriptures? And it appears many times. Here in Isaiah, the last days, Isaiah describes some future wonderful time, which seems to be in the near future for Isaiah. Hebrews, that we use for our call to worship, says that when Jesus came, we're in the last days. Jesus initiated the last days. We're in the last days. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, quotes Joel, who says, in the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all kinds of people. So when the spirit of God came, that's in the last days. And then, of course, the last days are going to be the, the, the literal last days. Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 3, says, first of all, you must understand this, that in the last days, Scoffers will come scoffing and indulging their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? So that points to the literal last days, the end. So when are the last days? When Isaiah foresaw some wonderful time when people will understand God's ways and will, and there will be peace, Certainly when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, we're reminded the last days have begun. When the Spirit was poured out upon all believers at Pentecost. And yes, of course, when he comes again, when our Lord comes again. So which is, which is right? Well, they're all right. Because what they're pointing to is a time when God's presence is with us in a special way. Of course, most special when Jesus came and, and when he comes again. The focus here in Isaiah is of this mountain growing and growing and growing, the mountain of Jerusalem, if you, if you will. That's the way they would see it. That's where the Lord was worshipped. That's where the temple was. Growing and growing and growing until it's the highest on earth and nations are streaming to it and Isaiah literally uses the idea of a, of a stream flowing streaming in and of course you know and I know water doesn't walk hill and Isaiah is purposely I think pointing out something here it's so powerful this draw that, that people go uphill as a stream wouldn't naturally flow uphill but people are flowing uphill all nations coming into the city. And what's the attraction? The attraction, of course, is the Lord himself. Hosea thinks about the same kind of thing happening. He says they will come trembling in awe. And where awe is kind of been misused and abused, but uh, there's only one awesome one, I like to say. And they will come trembling in awe to the Lord. They will receive his good gifts in the last days, like Hosea says. And of course, we have that beautiful image in the book of Revelation at the end, when John hears a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God 
himself will be with them, and he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there'll be no more death, no mourning, no crying, no pain, for all that's gone. The purpose for which these nations stream into the presence of the Lord is to hear his word, to understand his teaching, and to do it. That's what Isaiah tells us. They come that the Lord may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. Two things, that we might learn it and that we might apply it. The Lord will teach us his ways. The Creator knows what's best for us. We don't always respect that. We don't always literally believe it because we're stubborn. But to be successful and happy, to be fulfilled, is to understand the Lord's ways. I taught at the University of Maryland engineering for eight years. And one of the classes I taught was thermodynamics, and I taught it to electrical engineers. Electrical engineers come into the mechanical engineering department kicking and screaming. What do they need to know about thermodynamics? Thermo means heat, energy, dynamics, how it moves, how it changes, how it's used. And I had to, first of all, get their attention and tell them that anything that is electronic, at the very basic of, basics of electricity, are these very principles of thermodynamics so that they would sit there and listen and learn. That's the way we are. We've got to be sometimes kicked, dragged, screaming into God's presence and recognize His ways are the best. His teaching is what we need to know. And then Isaiah tells us that people will walk in His paths. They'll do it. You remember that very famous quote from James? doers of the word, not just hearers only. If all you do is hear it and don't do it, you're like somebody that looks in the mirror and forgets what they look like and go on their way and forget what they need to know. But if you keep looking steadily, James says, into God's perfect law, the law that sets you free, and you do it, and do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, and God will bless you for doing it. That's James chapter 1. So they need to know the Lord, they need to know his will, and they need to do his will, and if they do, then this is what Isaiah promises. God will judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The Lord will be the judge. He will do the arbitration. He will be the Supreme Court. He's unbiased. He'll get it right. He'll raise up the lowly and maybe bring down the high and mighty. But he'll do it in such a way that there'll be no more fighting. People will need to fight because everything will be fair and just and right. Justice will prevail. What does justice look like? Sometimes we forget that. I was reading this passage in James the other day, from James chapter 5, and one of my grandsons, um, I was talking with him, and he's very concerned about unrestrained capitalism, what it can do to, to poor people. And uh, I said, well, let's listen, listen to this passage in James. He was surprised that the Bible had such things to say. Come now, you rich people. Weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. Your riches have rotted and your clothes are moppy. Your gold and silver have rusted and their rust will be evidence against you. And it will eat your flesh like fire. You've laid up treasure for the last days. And that's what caught my attention, that the last days. Listen. Wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. 
You lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. God's justice, God's judgment will level out all the injustices that we tend to experience today. And of course, the most important thing that's mentioned here that catches our attention is peace will reign. God knows we need it. The means of war will be gone. They'll beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. The very practice of war, the very understanding of war, the very study of war will be gone. Nation will not lift up swords against nation. In fact, there won't be even the mentality of fighting war. They won't learn war anymore. Isaiah predicts. What does peace look like? Someday there shall be complete peace on earth. All shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. We look forward to that day. But there's peace that you and I experience now that Jesus brought in in these last days. Romans tells us, Paul in Romans, we are justified by faith and so we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have that peace that Paul mentions in Philippians that passes all human understanding and guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So someday we look forward to peace on earth, but we have peace with God. We have that unbelievable peace that comes from knowing it. I want to include verse 5 because after Isaiah describes this wonderful future, this future of peace, he says, O house of Jacob, he's talking to the people who are listening to it, let us walk in the light of the Lord. It's wonderful what's going to happen in the last days. We're looking forward to that, but we got light now to walk in. We never want to treat Jesus' second coming as something, as, as many churches do, you know, as something to discuss and argue about and put out there somewhere and fantasize about. No, no, it's a very practical reality that affects how we live now. It's affected the church from the very beginning. Peter, in the days in which Second Peter was written, says, first of all, you must understand this, that in the last days, scoffers will come and say, where is the promise of his coming? Gee, it had only been maybe 30 years when that was written. Where, where is he, when is he coming? Now it's 2,000 years. All right, when is he coming? The day of the Lord, Peter said, will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise and the elements dissolve with fire and the earth and everything in it will be disclosed that is there'll be changes made severe changes since all these things are to be changed, dissolved in this way, what sort of persons Peter's writing ought you to be knowing and waiting for and hastening that day in accordance with his promise we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home. What sort of persons are we to be knowing what God expects, what God is promising, what is going to happen? What, how should that affect how we live now? Of course, every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come on earth now as it is in heaven and as it will be someday in, in perfection. We want it to come now. We want to live now in the light of your kingdom. We know the Lord's will. We know the Lord's ways. O oh, people of Jesus, I might change from people of Jacob. O oh, people of Jesus, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. 
So, was it right for the early church to expect his coming very quickly and get frustrated when he hadn't come in 30 or 40 years? Have it us. I mean, he hasn't come in 2,000 years. Of course, my wife says, how come he hasn't come yet? And I said, well, if he'd come earlier, you wouldn't be. You know? and so he has a plan. He's coming when he's got everybody he wants. But right now, we know his teaching. We know his ways. Paul Garamark, back in the 1600s, wrote an Advent hymn, which is in our book. Oh, Lord, how shall I meet you? How welcome you, aright. Your people long to greet you. My hope, my heart's delight. O oh, kindle, Lord, most holy, your lamp within my breast, to do in spirit lowly all that may please you best. How should I greet you? How should I live in the last days? How should I greet the Lord when he comes? May I do all that pleases you best. O oh, people of Jesus, come let us walk in the light of the Lord. God help us. Amen. Lord, do help us as we, as we enter this Advent season in this very strange year. We've been separated from each other in ways that are painful sometimes. We haven't seen that family. We haven't seen friends up close. We haven't had lunches and breakfasts, get-togethers like we're used to. Lord, we yearn for the day when this will be. And Lord, we yearn for the day when you come again, Lord Jesus, to make right all that's wrong, to bring in justice, to raise up those who are fallen, to encourage the faint hearted and support the weak. Lord, we, we look forward to that day, but we want to live as your people in light of that, in our day, when it's not easy to do. So fill us with your spirit as a congregation, as individual Christians, we pray. In Jesus' name.